Bergman, who is a full professor of physics and conservation and restoration of cultural heritage at the University of Amsterdam and a senior scientist at the Rijks Museum. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, let's see. I hope everyone is able to see um, to see my screen. Uh, yes. Night watch on the left and so on. Yes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, two museum applications of um, neural network based generative technologies today. Um, the the most uh, well known of which uh, is the first, and that is. Um, the effort to recreate the missing pieces of Rembrandt's Night Watch. So what you see here on the left um, is Rembrandt's Night Watch in its current state. Um, the, the border around the edge um, is a lining canvas that was added after the restoration in 1976. And um, this is considered um, Rembrandt's masterpiece. It's certainly his biggest painting. Um, and it's sort of the centerpiece of the Rijksmuseum, which is the Dutch National Museum of Art and History, um, where I'm senior scientist. So um, the painting on the left um, is as we see it now, um, but the central figure of the painting, um, Frans Banning Koch, uh, which you see here in black, um, liked the painting so much um, after it was done. This was commissioned by this militia company here or the Civic Guard um from Rembrandt to to hang in the so-called Cloveniers Dule, which is the meeting place for all of the uh local civic guards of Amsterdam. He he liked the painting so much that he commissioned a small copy of it to hang in his own house. Um, and that's what you see over here on the right. Um, so the night watch is quite large if you're not familiar with it. It's four and a half meters wide and 380 uh, centimeters tall. Um, whereas the small copy is only um, 80 centimeters wide. Um, so the interesting thing about the small copy is that as as you can see, um, there are additional uh, figures here, um, especially on the on the left, but um, it's overall larger. And, and the reason is that um, when the Night Watch was originally painted, it was larger. And then uh, it was painted in 1642. And um, in 1715, probably long after most of the sitters here were dead, um, it was moved from its uh, normal home in the Cloveniers Dulin into the Stadthaus of Amsterdam. So uh, across town basically, and the room in which it was to be uh, placed had lower ceilings than would contain the painting. And it was to be placed between two doorways, um, which were unfortunately not wide enough to allow the painting to, to sit there without modification. So um, as was uh, not uncommon at the uh, in, in those days, they cut off the left side of the painting, they cut off the top, they cut off the bottom, and they cut off the right in order that it would fit there. So um, as part of the current effort um, to uh, engage in a huge research project and um, conservation treatment of the Night Watch, which is ongoing, called Operation Night Watch right now, um, I was asked to try to um, use the small copy here on the right to um, to recreate what the original pieces might have looked like. Um, so this is, this is quite a challenge um, for a number of reasons. Um, here, uh, this is a, a custom viewer that I've made um, uh, to, to help visualize the differences. So again, on the left is the night watch and on the right is the, is the copy by uh, Harriet Londons. So if I zoom in um, some distance, you can see that, um, well, first of all, uh, London's is really not quite as good a painter as Rembrandt. Um, that's no surprise, but um, the Rembrandt here is basically painted full size. So all the figures, um, you can actually stand face to face with them. The painting used to sit on the floor um, and, uh, and it's uh, painted on canvas and it has Rembrandt's very typical sort of chiaroscuro style, um, you know, very, um, very much for uh, highlighting the uh, figures in the foreground um, with a sort of mysterious lighting that comes out of nowhere. Whereas the small copy, the, the London's copy by Gerrit London's um, is painted on, uh, on panel instead of canvas. Um, he uses a different palette. 
Um, and um, it is also not geometrically faithful to the original. Um, as, as you can see here, um, in this visualization, wherever I put the mouse, um, it is shifting the two so that even though they cannot be um, broadly co-registered with each other, they can be locally co-registered with each other. So if, for example, I put the mouse here and I switch back and forth between the two, you can see there's really quite some difference. There's the night watch um, and there's the copy, the night watch and the copy and so on. So you can see that um, while uh, the copy has seemed to be fairly faithful in including all of the details that were there, um, he was not faithful in how he uh, rendered the colors and he was not faithful in the exact geometry. So the task now is given that um, I have this correspondence for most of the painting, can I teach a neural network how to translate from the painterly style, the palette, um, the brush strokes, um, the, the, the shading and so on of the copyist to those of Rembrandt. Um, and once I have a network that's good at doing that for the parts where I have both the copy and the night watch, then I can apply that, um, that learning um, to the missing parts which are present in the copy but which are missing um, in the night watch. So the trick here is that the reconstruction of these missing parts has to be completely geometrically consistent with the original because the end goal here is actually um, after imagining these on the computer uh, is to actually generate them, to print them out on a canvas like material, to mount them to four aluminum plates and to hang them around the actual night watch um, for uh, three months for an exhibition that happened, uh, that happened last summer. And there was a nice New York Times article about this in the end. Um, so to do this uh, required a sequence of three neural networks. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through very broadly what those, what those steps were. So here again, you see just the night watch, but now I've taken away the unsightly border. So everything that you see here is just original paint from, um, from Rembrandt. And you can see these large black um, regions around the edges here where there, there used to be painting, but now there isn't. Um, so first um, was a neural network to perform semantic matching. And so, um, you know, traditional computer vision techniques do not work here uh, in terms of feature matching because there's so much difference between the night watch and the London's. However, um, semantically, there is correspondence. When you see the tip of someone's finger in one painting, you can find the same tip in another. When you see um, the pupil of someone's eye, you can also find the pupil of their eye and so on. So this um, involved having the network find 10,000 semantic matches. And then this is the best possible semantic match between the two in which all we're doing is, is adjusting for perspective and, and so on. But as you can see, um, if I zoom in, uh, still this is far from, um, from acceptable match. So this is not generative yet. This is just trying to get them lined up. So the second neural network learns how to take this um, London's copy and to find a minimal distortion path that would warp it so that it is semantically aligned with the night watch. And that turns this into this. So again, you can see that um, there is some movement. Um, one uh, obvious example is here's the night watch and you can see that the angle of the feathers here on this cap are sort of sideways. And then the copy had them had the hat considerably taller and the, and the feathers kind of angled upward. Um, but now after applying the second neural network, we take this into this, and now I'm gonna jump back and forth between the night watch and the London's copy. So now you can see that they are um, at least uh, geometrically semantically aligned, although we still have the, uh, the palette, the style, um, um, the shading and so on of the copy. Um, so the final step is the generative step in which um, the, these two now nicely co-aligned images were utilized to, um, to teach the neural network uh, on a tile by tile basis, how to go from, um, from a tile of the copy to the corresponding tile of the night watch. 
like this. So I can cut this, this image up into thousands of little tiles and I can cut the night watch up into thousands of little tiles and I can teach a neural network how to, um, how to imagine what the Rembrandt tile would look like if shown only the copy tile. And then of course I know what the Rembrandt tile looks like. So this can serve as the training signal. Um, and so ultimately when you do this, um, then it turns this image into this image. So you can see that it's sort of, um, yeah. So again, the sequence is it goes from this to this to this. Um, and now I can compare that directly uh, to, to the Rembrandt. And of course, most of what it's doing in the middle of the painting, we don't care about. That's just a, a way to verify that it's doing something sensible. Um, and then ultimately, uh, the final answer is obtained by applying this network to the missing parts and then um, ensuring that we don't see any uh, obvious seams. So what you're seeing here is the final result. Um, and uh, so this is where the night watch ends right here, the, the actual night watch. Um, whereas this is the final answer. So hopefully you cannot tell that there is a seam here where the night watch um, ends and you can see that it's imagined these, uh, these figures off to the side from the copy um, in their chiaroscuro uh, shading. Um, entertainingly, you can see that the network even learns how to imagine the cracks um, and, and other uh, textures of the painting. Um, so uh, in, in the end, um, this is quite interesting because it gives us a completely different sense of, of the, the composition of the painting. And so this is what we wanted to convey to the public is that really the painting in its current form is somewhat cramped. Whereas now when you see these, uh, these added parts, now uh, these figures have a place to step out um, in, into the room with us, um, there's much more uh, flow, uh, dynamism, and um, they're not at the center of the painting anymore. Rather, this arch is the center, and we sort of expect them to become the center as they step out um, down toward us. Um, so that's the first, and then uh, very quickly, I will detail the second. Um, so when we um, are trying to identify uh, a work on paper, it's often convenient to look at the watermark. Um, but in many cases for a work on paper, um, whether it's a letter or a pastel drawing or a drawing or print, or it doesn't really matter, uh, we tend to have ink on one or more sides. And so identifying the watermark is only possible if you can read the watermark. Um, so um, essentially this is a generative task in which um, I took um, internet-based sources that, has, uh, that have lots of um, writing, in this case, Dutch writing, but it's, it doesn't have to be Dutch. Um, I used um, a network to extract the ink density. So this is sort of how hard, uh, how much ink um, would be present. I took a database of transmitted light images uh, through um, paper. So this is basically you take a, a light board and you put paper, the paper where you would like to read the watermark on it, and then you photograph it. Um, so these, this is an image that has no ink, but you can see the, the chain lines and the laid lines, and then here's the watermark. So I took the, uh, these samples of ink and I um, made a physics model that would simulate the addition of ink on the front and the back. Um, here is what it looks like when you have a no ink watermark and you add ink to the front and the back. So when, when there's ink on the back, it's blurry and this blurriness um, makes, makes it uh, also so that the paper adds some of its own color to things. So here you can see the sharp ink is the ink on the front and then you can see blurry ink that's ink on the back. And so by so doing, I could create a data set that had about 2 million pairs in which I have um, a, a watermark uh, image where, with no ink whatsoever. And then here I have one with ink that I have, I've simulated. So this is a fake with ink image. And then I can train a neural network to go the other direction. So I can train a neural network so that when I show it uh, an image with ink, um, it will imagine for me what it looks like without ink. And I will finish at that by showing you several examples. So in each case here, what you're seeing is um, an image um, from the wild with ink. Um, and then next to it is what the neural network comes up with when it removes the ink from 
uh, both the front and the back to enable us to read the watermark um, more readily. So here's one, a nice one where you can easily see that there's front and back ink uh, with different levels of blurriness, um, and then the result of having removed the ink um, across the board. Um, so um, two um, very different um, practical applications of generative networks um, here in use at the uh, Rijks Museum, and I'm delighted to take any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. This was great. Any, we have time. We have a couple minutes left for questions. Please feel free to unmute. Such a quiet group today. I have a question. Um, I, I, I that uh, the Watchman project was, was just so amazing. I what it seems extremely time intensive. How do you think this could potentially scale to other artworks, um, or how how would the museum think about doing that? You think? Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, surprisingly, it only took me about three weeks worth of work from scratch. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm using uh, probably 20 or 30 neural networks for the various things I do here at the Rex Museum. And this is just two I picked that were, you know, sort of generative um, for today's talk. But unfortunately, this is quite one off in the sense that it's extremely rare that you have uh, uh, an artwork who, um, for which you'd like to reconstruct some missing pieces, and you have a copy um, that has those missing pieces, but from a different artist. You know, there are some examples where you might have a print that is after a painting, but we, we don't have any of the painting. Um, so in this case, I think the most likely, uh, so if I take a big step back and I think, well, how could I use this more broadly? It's very common at the, in the museum world that um, decision makers would like to know, oh, what would this look like if we were to restore it? And, you know, because we need to make a decision about whether or not this is going to be worth the investment and so on. And so with a large enough data set of before restoration and after restoration, then essentially this is the same kind of problem where you have a, you, you have um, a geometric difference, you have color differences, you have texture differences, um, and But with a large enough training set, you could say, well, given this certain kind of restoration treatment that we are proposing, here is how one could imagine that this painting might look if it underwent uh, a conservation treatment. Um, but um, sadly, it's hard to find a lot more immediate uses for this, but I'm certainly open for any suggestions. Thank you. One more question, anyone? Nope. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and thank you again to our speakers for the great talks. Feel free to check out the notes document later and uh, add some more questions if, if they come up later. Thanks, everyone. Thank See you. See you next month. Thanks for having me. Thanks.